Hey, uh, I'm excited because uh, we're going to continue the series that we have uh, been looking at. And as you can see behind me, uh, we've entitled it The Making of a Game Changer. And as we had uh, said a few weeks ago, a game changer uh, is uh, someone that changes the game for either an individual or for a group of people. And what we want to do is, uh, I guess we want to set you up to be the game changer that God has created you uh, to become. And uh, so, Father, we're just excited about your word. We're excited that you are going to breathe into this atmosphere. Father, get a hold of our lives. Father, I know there are seeds of greatness sitting inside of every individual in this room. I know that you have fearfully uh, created us fearfully, wonderfully, Lord God. I thank you, Father, that you've set them apart for such a time as this. And I pray in the name of Jesus, God, let revelation flow from stage in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, look at the person next to you and say, get ready, get ready, get ready. So Judges uh, chapter 6 and verses 1, it says, uh, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, interesting fact is actually that statement uh, throughout the book of Judges is said seven times. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And you can see then, understand that a generation would follow after another generation. And it's like, this is God's chosen people. This is God's nation where He's had His hand and favor upon them. He set them apart uh, from the beginning of planet Earth. This is the nation uh, that God rescued. After 400 years of slavery, God pulled them out of that place. This is the nation that had incredible kings like King David, King Solomon. This is the nation that had uh, incredible uh, prophets that were in that place. Yet they continued to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. And it shows you how easy it is for a generation to forget what God has done in the past. Understand that uh, that's why it's so important that we as individuals, if you're a parent in this place, you'll understand the importance of passing the baton on to the next generation. We as a church, we ain't just here for ourselves. We're here to pass the baton on to the next generation. Right now, our kids are, are down the hallway and there the team are doing an incredible job passing the baton on to them. Every, understand that every one of us has a job to do in this place. And we, we've been looking at different characters. We've looked at uh, Joshua. We've looked at Esther. And last week we looked at Jesus, the ultimate game changer. Well, today we're going to look at another one. And uh, here we go. We're going to be looking at lessons from Gideon as it pops up on the screen. And uh, we're going to be looking at the life of Gideon, how he, can be he became a game changer at the time that he lived in. And uh, we're going to learn some principles out of his life. So we're going to Judges chapter 6, if you've got your Bible, or you can follow it on the screen here. And it goes a little bit like this. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, uh, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because of the power of Midian was so oppressive for themselves and mountain cliffs, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Ammonites and all the other Mozibites and Marmites and Vegemites, and if you're not from this part of the, uh, the other side of the planet, you won't understand what I'm talking about there. But you do understand that there are many ites that are going on in that place. Let's carry on with the scripture because uh, I'm mumbling, mumbling, and uh, let's carry on, Kerry Robertson. They camped on the land and they ruined crops all the way from Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, cattle, nor donkeys. And they came up with livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was so imp uh, impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land, uh, invaded the land and ravaged it. Uh, Midian was so, uh, so impoverished the, uh, the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. So the enemy, it says here, was so oppressive towards the Israelites. I don't know about you, but there have been moments in my life, and I'm sure there have been moments in your life where the enemy has come against you in incredible oppressive ways. Give me a show of hands in this place if you've ever had the enemy come against you and bring oppression into your world. There wouldn't be an individual. In fact, it says in John chapter 10 and verses 10 that the thief comes only to kill, steal, 
and destroy. And the enemy simply just wants to annihilate. He wants to knock you out. You may not realize, but there is a target on your life and the enemy is out. He's threatened by your very existence. He's threatened by the commitment. He's threatened by the passion and he's threatened by the fact that you are a child, a son or a daughter of the Most High. Uh, And here's the thing is that every one of us are going to go through trials. Every one of us are going to go through sufferings. And you're going to hear preachers that will tell you, come to Jesus. And if you come to Jesus, He'll take all your problems away. I'm going to tell you this, that is far from the truth. In fact, when I gave my life to Jesus, I had more issues that cropped up in my life. Come on, help me out in this place. The Bible does talk about trials and sufferings. But come on, I need to balance that. Uh, The good news is this, is that, you know what? God has given us the tools to kick the devil where it hurts. He's given us weapons of warfare. He's given us word, His Word to overcome. He's given us His authority to overcome. He's given us faith to overcome those things. You, don't know what, you wanna know what the Scripture says? Come on, this is what the Scripture says. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, the Lord will grant you, and you need to help me out here today, but the, the, the Lord will grant that the enemies who rise against me will be defeated before me. They'll come at me in one direction, but flee in seven. When the enemy comes in like a flood, he will raise up a banner. Philippians chapter 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What was meant for my harm, God's gonna turn it around for my good. 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given me a spirit of fear, but He's given me a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Psalm 3, uh, chapter 8, the Lord... From the Lord comes deliverance. Psalm 91 says this, No harm will overtake me. No disaster will come near my tent, for He will command His angels concerning me to guard me in all my ways. I will call on Him, and He will answer me. I will be within Him trouble. I will deliver Him. I will honor Him. With long life, I will satisfy Him, and I'll show Him my salvation. Come on, help me out in this place. Romans chapter 8, 37. I'm more than a conqueror through him who loves us. 1 John 5, 4. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that comes from the world, our faith. Psalm 54, 7. For you have rescued me from my troubles and helped me to triumph over my enemies. Isaiah 54, verse 7. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. If God be for me, who can be against me? Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Come on, I tell you this. Come on, we should be excited about this in this place because guess what? I read the end of the book and guess what? We win. We win. Come on, settle down. Let's carry on with the story. Judges chapter 6, verses 11. The angel of the Lord came where Gideon was threshing the wheat in the wine press, uh, keeping it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now note where Gideon is at this moment. It tells us with the Scripture, it tells us that he's hiding out. I mean, the Mennonites are so powerful, they're so strong, you can't count them, uh, they've impoverished the land, and the last thing he wants to do is uh, show them the f- little food that he's got left over. He, wants to, he doesn't want to get out in public because it's likely that he's going to lose his head, lose his life at that time. Uh, but God shows up while he's hiding, hiding out, freaking out, <gasps> I might die. And God shows up and He says, mighty warrior. I want you to notice that He called him not where He was, but He was speaking to him from where His potential would end up. And sometimes we have the Word of the Lord come to us that seems so far from our current reality. God tells you that you're loved. The last thing I feel is loved and accepted. God tells you you're blessed. Well, you've seen my bank account. Come on, I'm far from blessed. God says, you know what? You're healed, but you know what? I'm limping around in pain at this time. You need to know this, that God speaks to your future. You need to know that principle. Let's continue. Verses 13. He says, and I wonder if Gideon had a bit of English in him because it says here, pardon me, Lord, Gideon replied, But if the Lord is with us, then why has this all happened to us? For all these wonders that the ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us to the hand of Midianites. The Lord turned to him and said, go in strength you have have, and save Israel out of the Midian's hands. I'm not sending you. Pardon me, Lord, Uh, Gideon replied. But, and he goes on here, and he makes this statement, my clan is the weakness, is, is the weakest, and I'm the least of my family. 
So here he is making a statement. I am the least of the least. I'm the smallest. I'm a nobody in this place. And simply what Gideon was trying to do was disqualify himself from the fact that God called him to be this mighty warrior. I mean, God speaking to him about not only being a warrior in an army, but actually leading that army uh, to defeat this enemy that had impoverished him for six or seven years at this time. And so often we as individuals, when God speaks to us, it's easy for us to disqualify ourselves based on what we've been through. And we kind of back up. But my childhood, uh, and you probably look at me and you go, you know, there's a good looking guy with the body of a Greek God. And uh, what are you laughing for? Okay, far from that, I know that. But uh, in my childhood, there were moments where I got severely bullied. I, I'm remembering a guy uh, in my grade, his name was Micaiah. I was probably eight years of age. And uh, this particular guy, I mean, I had one of those bully me faces. Anyone ever had one of those bully me faces? You know, those faces, it's like, you just got picked on because you just had that face that says, I wanna beat you up. Come on, anyone in this place, all right? A few hands in this place. That was my face. And I just had my face uh, at times bullied. Uh, I was pushed around. And I remember on a particular day, the car took me into the toilets, threw me into the urinal, started kicking me up against the urinal and with urine and, you know, all that stuff going on in that place. And I was not a happy camper. In fact, I had a few tears rolling down my face at that time. And eventually he let me go out of that bathroom cubicle, out of that toilet and went, stepped out. And who was standing on the other side of that was a teacher. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Uh, he, you could see me crying. You could see me wet. What's going on here? Makai walked out of that place and I was... Man, boldness came on me at that moment. I was like, uh, teacher, he just beat me up. This is what he did to me. You need to give him a detention. You need to suspend him. In fact, death penalty, right? I mean, I got a little bit bold at that particular time. But uh, I, the, the thing was, is that I can look at those moments and go, you know what? I was a bully. I was picked on. Uh, I disqualify myself because I'm, I'm no one. I don't have strength. I don't have... I guess my way with words to get around things. I was telling Luke on the run, front row here. I was uh, first year of high school. And uh, it's kind of the first two weeks of school and you're kind of first, you know, trying to get yourself established in school. There, there I am, uh, sitting at the back of the class because that's what you do if you want to be cool. But I mean, two of the hottest girls. I mean, you remember the hot girls at school. It's like, man, they was kind of second row from the front. They were sitting at the front there and, Man, they were good looking. And for a guy that's just gone through puberty, uh, that kind of never was interested in girls, but now is interested in girls. It's like, if I want to have friends with anyone, I want these girls to be my friends. Like, you know, you just turn up high school, you've got to make yourself away. Well, they're sitting down in the middle of the class, and who's sitting in front of them is a guy by the name of Vance. Now, Vance was a, you know, way with words and cool kid, you know, good looking and I just watched him. I watched how he interacted. And I was like, I could learn from this guy. Watch how he does it. Maybe I could learn some stuff. And anyhow, I noticed him do something. And he, he, he did this. And then he turned around and he did this to the girls. I mean, the girls. I mean, they laughed their heads off. They thought it was so cool. They thought it was amazing. And I was just like, man, I'm in. All I got to do tomorrow is do exactly what Vance did. And so I got there early. I knew where those girls sat. I knew that I'm, I'm in. I'm going to be in with these girls. They're going to be part of me. They're going to be wanting to date me. I don't have to chase them. They're going to be chasing me. Well, I beat Vance to the seat. Vance had to sit down the back of the class. The girls were already pre-seated there. And well, came a moment. I positioned myself and... <coughs> well, I did that. And the girls... I mean, you probably thought they got on their knees and started worshiping me. You probably thought they pulled out their mobile phone. They didn't pull out their mobile phones. They didn't have mobile phones in those days. You probably thought they got their notebooks out and said, man, you're going to need to give me the number. Date me. No, no, no. They fought over each other, pulling each other's head. I want him. No, that was far from what actually happened. Yeah, no, no, no. They, they looked at me and said, what a geek. What a dork. What a nerd. We don't want to just go sit somewhere else. And see, see, I can look at those moments in my past and disqualify myself that I'm unwanted. I got bullied. I got pushed around. Uh, I, I got a little bit older, 16 years of age. And oh, I, I know you look at me and go, man, 
He must have been incredibly intelligent. What are you laughing for? Uh, I mean, straight A student, you're looking at me going, he, he's got the smarts. I, I know, I know I've, 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 I've learned to fool you, but in school, I, I kind of just did what I had to do to get through. Anyone else like that in this place? It's just like you just get past, get the exams. Not like the other nerds like Erica here that just doesn't have to study and gets to the front of the class. And is that right? Is that what she's like? And uh, kind of what, you know, yeah, we hate you. Um, <laughs> uh, jokes, right? Don't take offense to that one, please. And but, but, he, but I mean, I, I failed. I, I, I messed this and I had to redo tests and redo assignments. And I remember walking home every day with a guy by the name of Dean. Well, Dean, he was a smart guy. He knew that I was not so intelligent. And he would tell me every day that you're stupid. You're not going to get a job one day. Uh, he would then go tell me that, you know, one day you're going to be a cleaner. And uh, you know what? You're not going to be able, you, you, you're not going to be able to get a job. So you're going to work for me cleaning my multi uh, million dollar company, and uh, I, I'm going to pay you $4 an hour. That's all you're going to be worth, $4 an hour. I mean, that's what he told me. And he said that to me day after day after day, and I'd look at my results, and I'd listen to what he had to say, and the rejection I was getting from here and there. I could easily disqualify myself from becoming what God had called me to become. And see, what we have in the situation it is a moment where we have Gideon disqualifying himself from what God had called him to do. The Lord answered, uh, I will be with you and I will strike down all the Midianites and leave nothing alive. So today we're talking about lessons from Gideon. Are you ready for this? Number one, as it comes up on the screen, Gideon stopped believing lies and started to believe the truth of what God said about him. And if you want to be a game changer, the game changer that God's created you to become, you need to stop listening and believing the lies that the enemy has convinced you to believe. Because the enemy will tell you that you're fat. He'll tell you that you're ugly. He'll tell you that you're unloved, that you're unmarriable. He'll tell you that you'll fail, that you're going to lose money. He's going to tell you that you'll never become anything in life. And he will start saying those things time and time again. In fact, he'll start pointing out things in your life that may not be working the way it should be going. And he's going to go, look, I'm going to destroy you this way. I'm going to knock you out this way. And you can easily lean into those places and start le listening and believing those lies. But if you want to be a game changer, can I say this? As it says on the screen there, stop believing the lies and start listening to the truth of what God has called and said about you. It's what you, come on, turn to the person next to you and say, you've got to listen to this message. You've got to listen to this message. And you know what? Uh, you know, what does God say? Well, God says about me that I'm loved. He says that I'm favored. He says that I'm blessed. He says that I have an incredible future. He says that I'm the head and not the tail on top and not the bottom. He says that I'm more than a conqueror. He says I'm incredible things. In fact, He created me. In fact, the Bible says before He created me, He gave me purpose. He's given you purpose. He's given you an incredible life. And I could easily give you 50 scriptures. We don't have time to do that of the promises of an incredible future, the promises of amazing blessings that God is gonna bring into your life. So stop believing the lies and start believing the truth. Number two is Gideon tore down the altars of false gods. And if we want to be individuals that are game changers, we're gonna have to tear down false gods. Now you're saying, what are you talking about? Uh, false gods, I mean, what, what are we talking about? Are we looking at spelling there? Is that what you're looking at? My wife's just done the whole, oh, like this. There you go. It was a late night last night. Let me just say that one. It was after midnight and uh, anyhow. But anyway, it had no, but anyway, verses 25, the same night the Lord said to him, tear down your father's altar uh, to Baal and cut down the astral pole beside it. Now they worship Baal. Now, what was the worship of Baal all about? Well, it was basically a uh, worship of a fertility god. And they would set up these altars where literally there were temple prostitutes that would have sex with people. They would have mass orgies around these things. And here you have the Israelites who love God, who worship God, but over a period of time, they allowed the gods of these pagan nations and these occulted practices that seeped into what they were doing. And what happened was they, they, they loved God. 
but they allowed these other occultic things to come into the place. And so God said to him, he goes, before you can be a mighty warrior, before I send you out, I need you to tear down these altars because it's these altars that are stopping people becoming the warriors that they've been called to become. And so that's exactly what he does. He goes after and he knocks down those things. And it specifically says there, it's tear down your father's altars. His dad was part of building these altars. His dad was part of these practices. Likely Gideon had been part of these practices. It was kind of the sacrifice, the human sacrifices that took place at this particular time. And uh, here's the thing is that, you know what? We may not have those altars today. We may not have altars or let's say this idols that we bow down to. There may be other nations around the planet where they've got idols. But it's see, in this region, there are different types of altars. There are different types of pagan rituals. There are different types of things that people make idols out of. And you're saying, what are we talking about? Well, you know what? Their God could be their house. Their God could be that car. Their God could be sport. Their God could be money. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a house. There's nothing wrong with having a car. There's nothing wrong with enjoying sport. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with you having money. Come on, help me out in this place. But, but the question is this, do you have money or does money have you? I'll say it again, do you have money or does money have you? And that's when you know you've got an idol in your life when money is controlling you, when everything inside of you, the love of money is the root of all evil, evil as it says. It doesn't say money is the root of evil, it's the love of money. And when we're waking up and yes, we've got to go to work and yes, we've got to provide for our family, but when we're chasing after stuff, and the God is money, the God is mammon. I'm telling you, that's the, that's the altar we need to tear down. Come on, God's gotta be our supplier. God's gotta be our number one that's in our life. Come on, I'm preaching better than you're responding here in this place. And so you know what? There may be altars God tells you, you need to tear down. Those altars might be altars of lust, altars of mammon, altars of violence that's going on in your life. Tear that stuff. And you say, how do you tear that stuff down? Well, it starts with repentance. Repentance simply means I'm gonna turn 180 degrees from this practice. I know it used to be my God, but that God is no longer uh, a capital G. It's a little G in my life. I'm not gonna let sport dictate my life. I'm not gonna let money dictate my life. I'm turning and my God is my sole source. The God of the Bible, the one that created the heavens and the earth. To be a game changer, you need to tear down some altars in your life. Number three is getting caught people to battle. Gideon called people to battle. Judges chapter 6, 34. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon and he blew the trumpet, summoning the people to follow him. And he sent messages throughout the region, calling them to arms. Oh, I love this one. Calling them to arms. So game changers are people that call people to battle. Call people to arms. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, it says that, uh, the sword of the Spirit is one of the weapons that God gives us. And I'm gonna just say this, is that God has called every one of us to fight, to fight the enemy that comes against us. And 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 12, it's, it got, uh, Paul says to, Saul, uh, so it says to Timothy, let's get this right, he says, fight the good fight of faith. Now, I wanted to know what's a good fight. Well, if I go back to my high school years, a good fight is one that you won. If you lost the fight, you never wanted to talk about it. You never wanted to bring it up. You didn't want that, that shame in your life. But if you won the fight, that was a good fight because we overcome, we beat them. It's, it was the one that's worth talking about. Uh, about. And I just wanna say this, that God's called us to fight the good fight. And that fight's not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities and powers and against rulers of darkness and this wicked world around about us. You say, well, how do I use the, this weapon called the sword of the Spirit? I'm glad you asked. Well, in prayer, you bring out Scripture. In prayer, you declare, you tell the devil back off because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. You prophesy over your future with Scripture. No, 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 no. I don't care what my bank account says. I don't care what the paycheck says. God says that I will be abundantly blessed. The Bible says that daily God will load me with blessings. Come on, you hear me? I'm telling you this, no matter what the enemy brings, come on, fight that devil, fight that enemy with Scripture. Come on, if you believe it, put your hands together. So men, I'm telling you, I'm calling you to arms. 
Men, I'm telling you to stand on behalf of your family, fight for your family. Women uh, and parents, I'm calling you to stand and fight uh, for the people around about you. And I'm actually calling every single one of you in this place to arms, to fight the good fight so that the church can become all it's been called to become. Come on, Jesus, what did He say? I'll build the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And when an army, the army of God raises up, knowing how to pray and confess Scripture and tell the devil how to back off. Devil, you have no hold or authority on any person in this house. Game changer, church. Take your hands off these people in Jesus' name. That's what it's about. So game changers calls people to arms. And we as individuals, I'm calling you to arms, but there's gonna come moments where you're gonna call others to arms. Because I've discovered this in my parenting, there are some fights that I needed to fight on behalf of my kids. But there comes an age where I've actually gotta let them fight. I can't let someone on the front row here in her early 20s fight every battle uh, through me. She's actually gotta take up the sword of the Spirit herself and fight those battles for herself because there'll come a day where daddy ain't there. Daddy ain't around them. And see, that's what discipleship's about. They may not be your flesh and blood. They may be disciples around about you. They're not gonna be with you 24 seven. They're not gonna be with you every day of the week. But come on, you need to equip them with arms to take up the sword of the Spirit, teach them how to pray, teach them how to confess, teach them how to knock that devil down. But I want you to have a look here because Gideon gathered the, an army of 32,000 men. It's pretty impressive, right? Uh, so let's have a look here, Judges chapter 7, 23. If I could have some music, that would be amazing. He says this, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me uh, and, and by my strength, save me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and lead. So 22,000 left men, 10,000 remain. 32,000, now we've got 10,000. But 10,000 still a pretty good army. But see, chapter eight tells us that the Midianites had an army of 135,000 soldiers. Shoot, this ain't, this ain't looking good. Have a look at point four. It'll be a game changer. Gideon selected men that kept their eyes on vision instead of their current needs. Read that. Gideon selected men that kept their eyes on the vision instead of their current needs. Let's have a look at this. Judges 7, verses 4. But the Lord said to Gideon, There's still too many men. Take them down to the water and I will thin them out for you there. And if I say this one shall go with you, then he shall go. But if I say that one is not to go, then he shall not go. So the Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down and drink. 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but he kept 300 who took over the provisions and the trumpets of others. Now there's 135 Midianites, 300 of Gideon's men. That means that if each of Gideon's men had a number, 450 people each they had to knock out, an impossible situation. But with 300 men, God saved the nation. If you read on, you find out 300 men, God changed the game for a nation and wiped out those people. Let's just have a look at this. Drinking, water is a basic human need. When you get thirsty, 
what do you do? You take a drink. You, 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 it's, a, it's a basic, see, we've got these basic human needs, food, water, shelter, clothing. Another basic human need is to be loved. God created us for us to, to be loved and to give love. So we need food to survive. We need clothes to keep warm. We need a house to live in. We need a car for transportation. We need someone to love. But the pursuit of getting these things takes your eyes off the vision. Then you disqualify yourself from what God has called you to about to say. Because look at this. There were some that were doing this. Their eyes were looking down and they'd taken their eyes off the vision. But then there were others that kept their eyes on the vision. What was the vision for them? To take down that enemy. They still needed the drink. That They still needed to fulfill some of that stuff. But they needed to keep their eyes on vision. God has called every one of us to an incredible future. But it's very easy for us in the pursuit of finding someone to, to love. If I take my eyes off God, in the pursuit of getting that house, I take my eyes off God. We disqualify ourselves. You say, well, what's the vision? The number one vision for every single one of you in this place is your relationship with God. That is a vision for every one of us to become mature believers, to grow in the things of God. Number two, you've got a personal calling. God has called you to do something significant on planet Earth. For some of you, it's to be the most amazing mum on planet earth. For some of you, it's to be the most amazing business person that you can be. For some of you, it's to preach the good news. For some of you in this place, to be an incredible disciple. God has called you for such a time as this. We've also been called to reach the lost. We've also been called to disciple the next generation. But while we do all these things, we've got to make sure that we keep the eyes on the prize, rather letting the needs take us away. Hear me. But you read on, you find out that 300 supernaturally knock out an army of 135,000 people. How good would it have been to be one in 300? a sec. Kind of reminds me of something was talked about a few weeks ago, something that I dropped a few weeks ago. The vision that I laid a few weeks ago. What was the vision? What's the 1 in 300 vision to raise up 300 people that would disciple 10 people? See, we're all called to do something significant and sometimes we wonder, can God do anything with just such a small amount? Come on, we're living in a region where there are literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people that live in the, uh, the, the, the surrounding areas around about us. What could a few people do? It's amazing when we partner with God. The question that comes up on the screen. Pop the next thing up on the screen. Imagine being one in 300. With every eye closed across this place. Like Gideon, you are called to be a game changer. Like Gideon, you are called to change the course of history. Whether it's for an individual or for a group of people. I'll make it really clear, you are called to change the game for your family to game, change the game for your marriage. Imagine what it'd be like to be one in 300, to be part of a team here at Game Changer Church 
that says, you know what, I wanna do my part in discipling another generation of people. I wanna take the baton that's been placed in my hands. I wanna pass it on to the next generation. Imagine being one of 300. And over the last few weeks with, I guess I'll, I've hit this home so many times. As you heard beforehand, we're about to launch connect groups. For some of us in this place, we're gonna start out being a disciple. We should all be disciples no matter what age we are. Some of us are called to be disciplers. Some of us in this room are called to, to come alongside another connect group leader, support them in what they're doing. God has called us to be one in 300. My question for you, will you be one in 300? Now may not be the time, but at some point in your future, God's gonna say, hey, it's your time. I want you to pass. It's been put in your hands with another group of people. Father, breathe on every individual. Drop a desire, Father, to, to make a difference in the lives of people around about us. There are incredible gifts and talents, knowledge, passions sits in the hearts of every individual in this room it's amazing God it's amazing as I look across these incredible people Lord God the significance of the callings on people's lives God let us not be selfish what you've given us Father help us pass it on in Jesus name in Jesus name with every eye closed in this place. Why don't we just all stand across this room? Why don't we just lift our hands in front of us? Thank you, Father. Father, we surrender to your purpose, plans. Jesus, come, O oh God. Come, O oh God. close, you can put your hands down, but maybe you've turned up here today, you don't have a relationship with God. On the count of three, when I get to three, if you're in this room and you don't have a relationship with God, you say, Pastor, would you include me in a prayer? I want to get my life right with God. Would you lift your hands? Maybe you've never done it before. Maybe you're backslidden. Maybe you're just not living 100% for Him. Today, you're responding. I want to get my life right with you. Here we go. One, bold, two, and left and right of you. Here we go. Three, lift your hands if that's you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Say these words after me, dear Heavenly Father. Come on, everyone out loud. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you forgive me of all my sin. Jesus, come into my life. I wanna follow you from this point forward. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, let's give God a hand in the place here. Incredible.